Thank you so much, my friends. I'm, first of all, so relieved to see a clock in front of me. You know, I'm from the East, and the East, we keep on talking till somebody snores. Uh, but I shall exercise Islamic self-restraint. Truly, as a Muslim, I am deeply honored to be in this holy sanctuary. I'm reminded of the time in the seventh century when uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had a mosque just next to his house and he would receive many delegations of Jews and Christians and sometimes the talks went on very long and each time he would say, I beg you, I beg you, please, do the Shabbat, do the Sunday service in the mosque because the mosque is simply a place consecrated to God. This is a place simply consecrated to God. My friends, the history of humanity has been that we have not always welcomed the stranger. In fact, almost always there has been a pattern of an outcry of fear, distrust, suspicion, anger. The wise have told us we learn from history that we do not learn from history. So in a way, we are stuck in patterns of human conditioning. In the Islamic teaching, there's a story of the mullah who goes to work, opens his lunch pail box, and what does he find? A cheese sandwich. Second day, third day, fourth day, it's always a lousy cheese sandwich. Tenth day, I'm getting sick and tired of this lousy cheese sandwich. So his puzzled co-worker says, Mullah, why don't you ask your wife, be persuasive with her, to make you another kind of sandwich? I'm not married, who makes them? I do. So now, how do we get to the heart of a tradition, any tradition, in a multi-religious society? My parents were students, they loved Mahatma Gandhi. And from his work, they said there were three points that Gandhi always made about peace in a multi-religious society. Number one, it is the sacred duty of every individual to have an appreciative understanding of the other person's religion. Please be with that. Sacred duty, appreciative understanding. And this conforms very beautifully with the insight of the Quran. The most used word in the Quran is Allah. The second most used word is a word called ilm, I-L-M, meaning knowledge. A verse in the Quran says, a beautiful prayer is, O oh God, advance me in knowledge. Prophet Muhammad said, seek knowledge from cradle to grave. The Prophet said, the ink of the scholar is more holy than the blood of the martyr. Gandhi would say, it's not enough to say, I am open-minded. He would say, what are you open-minded about? If you don't have an actual appreciative understanding, no matter how open-minded you are, the danger is very soon you will judge a religion on the basis of the terrible acts of some practitioners. It's human nature. Therefore, to have an appreciative understanding of another person's religion 
for me as a Muslim to know about Judaism, about Christianity, my neighbor who might be a Buddhist or a Hindu, is not just important. It's a matter of our survival. Point number two. Gandhi said, let's acknowledge every single religion has truths and untruths. If somebody got excited, he would say, I am not saying the revelations are not divine. They might be divine. But human consciousness is less than perfect. When that touches a divine verse, the interpretation, the understanding, the comprehension can be less than divine. As we have been told again and again, we do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. I love the 13th century sage Rumi, and he would say about interpreting verses, he says it depends on two things, your level of consciousness and your intention. You know, Rumi never wrote, just would utter in a trance. And his famous words are, a bee and a wasp, they drink from the same flower. One produces nectar, other one produces a sting. But you know, this insight, truths and untruths, has many more facets. It's about theology and spirituality. It's about the danger of being overly attached to one's religious institution. I am from Bangladesh. We have this Bengali poet from West Bengal who said, while God waits for his temple to be made out of love, man brings stones. And there's this famous story in each of our Abrahamic faiths that we ask to ponder on. God comes down and reveals certain basic truths to some people. But then the devil comes along and says, let me organize that for you. And that becomes religion. <laughs> you know, in the Islamic tradition, there's this beautiful story of the mullah, very allegorical. The mullah is invited to this house of worship one evening. And the religious leader is talking about the superiority of his religion is better than any other religion. And just at that time, there's a fierce storm, very severe. And the rafters of the house of worship begin to sway and creak ominously. And the leader says, don't, please don't worry, please don't worry, you see? Out of love, the rafters are singing hymns of praise to God. Mullah said, excuse me, but what if out of love for God, the rafters suddenly decide to bow and prostrate to God? <laughs> you know, some of you know I work very closely in an emerging ministry besides my own ministry with the Interfaith Community Church, which also is one of our sponsors, by the way. And I and Rabbi Ted Falcon and Pastor Don McKenzie, we have been working two together since, uh, since my hair was black, actually, 9-11. And we have developed a trust, a friendship. We go all around the country. And we've begun because of our womb of safety to talk about that which is difficult and awkward, not in your religion, in my own tradition. Not to criticize, 
But to begin the process of healing by naming it, and as Prophet Muhammad said, to move from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart. And everywhere we have gone in the last one year and six months, we've had major, at least 100 programs, there has been such a resurgence of enthusiasm for this kind of talk because it is healing as we see this as an invitation to bring a higher light to shine on it. And what are those four categories in every tradition, certainly Islam also? Exclusivity, violence, inequality of women, and homophobia. Third point Gandhi made. He said, if some religious extremists commit a wrong, violence for example, he said, I beg you please, do not criticize this person's religion. That's not the way. Point out to this person. Bring to this person's attention insights and verses of beauty and wisdom from this person's own tradition. So about the area of violence, I've had so much occasion to, uh, I, I would say the, the most popular three verses that I have used from the Quran, repel evil with something which is better. So he with whom you have enmity becomes as though he is an intimate friend. Second one, let there be no compulsion in religion. Third one, don't allow hatred of others towards you to cause you to be unjust. Be just, be just. This is closest to God consciousness. My friends, every single religion asks us to do two things. Number one, to become a better human being, to evolve into the fullness of our being. In Islam, we say, insane kamil, to become more fully human. The second one is to be of service to God's creation. To be a lamp, a lifeboat, or a ladder, as the mystics say. In Islam, you do this through Islam, the meaning of which is to surrender to God in peace. Whenever I make presentations with Rabbi Ted Falcon and Don McKenzie, I always say publicly that uh, Rabbi Ted Falcon and Don McKenzie, Pastor Don McKenzie, are two of the best Muslims I know. Because to be a Muslim simply means one who has surrendered one's attachment to one's ego. So one can bring, as the Quran says, a heart turned in devotion to God. So in the Quran, peace be upon them, Abraham is a Muslim, Moses is a Muslim, Jesus is a Muslim, among others. About surrender, the two things I'd like you to know. One is, we don't volunteer to surrender. Number two, the work is difficult. The Prophet was asked one day, what is this work? He said several things. One is, know thyself and you shall know thy sustainer. Second one was, die before you die. Die to your ego before you die a physical death. Third one, as the Quran says, open for me my heart. 
But all this talk about prayers and die before you die is very, very inconvenient. Because the two veils, called the veils of health and wealth, that prevent us from becoming a seeker. But should one of those veils of health or wealth, which means money and emotional security, should they shatter? Then deeper questions. Who am I? I need help. The Quran says, say, my life, my living, my dying, my prayers, my sacrifices are all for you. That wonderful poet, 14th century Hafiz, he says, something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need for God absolutely clear. What is fascinating is that in Islamic spirituality, this work, die before you die, is called giving birth to your inner Jesus. You see, Muslims believe in the virgin birth. And of course, as I travel the country for the last couple of years, I've become, I'm becoming more and more convinced that more Muslims than Christians believe in the virgin birth. In the Quran it says, Mary, peace be upon her, she suffered birth pangs. This is difficult work. She retired to a desolate place and magically a palm tree came to life and offered her dates and a stream appeared before her, offered her water. Meaning, as the Prophet Muhammad said, you take one step towards God, God takes seven steps towards you. You walk towards God, God comes running towards you. And most important, in Sufism it is said, to give birth to your inner Jesus, you need the receptacle of a Mary. You need the womb of vulnerability and compassion without which it is difficult for one's divine identity to step forward, to emerge. Which leads me to the question, what is the core teaching of Islam? For many, it is compassion. The Prophet Muhammad once said, all that is in the holy books is in the Quran. All that is in the Quran is in the first chapter called Surah Fatiha. All that is in the Surah Fatiha is in the formula called Basmallah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, boundlessly compassionate, infinitely merciful. This opens virtually the 114 chapters of the Quran, except for one. When a Bedouin asked the Prophet, how can I have this beautiful Basmallah to be bestowed upon me? The Prophet said two things. One is, be compassionate with yourself. And second, be compassionate with others. That is why Muslim teachers are very eager to explain the majesty, the beauty, the power of compassion for oneself and others. The closest metaphor in nature is water. There is nothing as soft and yielding as water is, yet for overcoming the hardest, nothing is as powerful as water is, meaning the person who is gentle, compassionate, merciful, is authentically strong, powerful. Then the Quran suggests wherever water falls, Life flourishes. A, a verse in the Quran says, the earth was parched, the waters of mercy came down, and the earth became clothed in green. So the person who is authentically compassionate is authentically strong and life-giving. 
Rumi has this wonderful verse, how should spring bring forth a garden on hard stone? Become earth, so you may grow flowers of many colors, for you have been a heart-breaking rock. Just once, just once, for the sake of experiment, become earth. What is one beautiful practice in Islam? Prayers. You saw a spring last night here. We go like this. Every motion has a very deep meaning. For example, when the Muslim goes like this, it means, oh God, as I stand before you, I am putting the world behind me and I'm really listening, bowing, prostrating. And what are Muslims saying? They're saying two things, praising God and thanking God. And how did this idea come about? No one knows, but the, a lot of Muslims say when Prophet Muhammad had this fantastic epiphany of ascending seven levels of heaven from which comes this insight, I'm in seventh heaven, he looked around him and he saw angels all around him. He was dazzled by the sight of angels going like this, like this, like that, and praising God. And Prophet Muhammad said, a prayer must consist of using the gift of the human body to express this adoration to God. And why five times? The mythology is as he came down the seven levels of heaven, Moses met him. And Moses said, what did some aspect of divinity tell you? And the prophet said, divinity said, we must pray 50 times a day. Moses said, impossible, I know our community, they will never pray 50 times a day, go back. 40 times, 30 times, 20 times, 10 times, 5 times. Moses said, go back, to 5 times is too much. Apparently, Prophet Muhammad said, I'm too embarrassed. So it is that collaboration which has created 5 times a day. And Muslims have great faith in the power of this body prayer. Let me just tell you a quick story, and I'm watching the time. Very allegorical story. The mullah is in jail, imprisoned for life, very unhappy. But now he feels hopeful. Why? Because he has heard his teacher has permission to visit him. And why is he happy? Because he's absolutely sure the teacher will slip in a weapon or a key to escape. The teacher comes and gives him a lousy prayer rug. Of course, he says, thank you, thank you. But as the teacher goes away, he says, of what use is, is this to me? But he has time on his hand. He spreads it out. And he starts, oh God, you're the greatest of the greatest. Thank you, God. He doesn't mean a word. But he bows, he stands up, he prostrates. But as he does these prayers over the days and weeks and months, he begins to realize there's a special design in the prayer rug. He looks closely is a design of an escape route from the prison. <laughs> Muslims say, one prostration of prayer to God frees you, liberates you from a thousand prostrations to your ego. You know, Muslims pray towards the Kaaba, the symbolic house of God in Mecca. Rumi's teacher, Samza Tabriz, said, look at this, 24 hours a day, in a circle, Muslims are bowing down to the Kaaba. He says, take the Kaaba away, what do you see? Human beings are bowing to other human beings, meaning, real prayer is about service. Prophet Muhammad said, do good deeds according to your capacity. God never tires of doing good deeds, of, of giving you rewards, unless you tire of doing good deeds. And the good deeds most loved by God are the ones you do regularly, 
no matter how small they are. That's why Rumi says, from a blind man, two drops of light are enough. And become a lamp, a lifeboat, or a ladder. You know, one of the greatest acts of service we can do today is to follow this Quranic verse which has had not, had not had too much commentary in the past, but in recent times it's become a verse on which there's a lot of commentary, the verse which says, get to know the other. In several verses of the Quran, God says, if God wanted, God could have made everybody one single community. But God chose out of a divine design to give each community a law and a way of life. Prophets, books, made us into nations and tribes, men and women, for two reasons. Number one, that you might vie with each other in doing good works. But the one I'm eager to tell you is, the Quran says, so you might get to know the other. Last night, Imam Faisal Rof told us about the zero, ground zero controversy. You know, just after that, there was such a backlash that all over America, there was an outcry, I don't want a mosque to be built in my state. And all the polling showed that 60% of people in every state said, I don't want a mosque. Only 37% said, I'm okay with that. But here's the good news. Each one of the 60% who said, I don't want a mosque, each one said, I don't know even one Muslim personally. And each of the 37% who said, I'm in favor of it, each one said, I know at least one Muslim personally. So this work of getting to know the other no, no need to change the other, simply to connect. I'll just end by saying, a few years ago, I knew a couple of Christians, very right-wing, who I can say safely, when they heard the word Islam, they developed an allergic reaction physically. So I made it a point to really get to know the other without any agenda, simply on a human level. It took two years, but I'm glad to say they have lost their allergy. But the greater story is how I have become transformed. I didn't realize how narrow I was in my stereotyping of Christian evangelicals. I had no idea there's such a vast range among them. I had no idea there was such sweetness in their community. I had no idea of their dedication to social justice issues and earth care. So because we are friends now, here's what's happened. The same theological differences persist, but now it does no longer loom as a threat. And secondly, we're able to collaborate on all these issues dear to both of our hearts, social justice issues and earth care. I was very privileged to be reading a book which is going to be published next year about six Islamic scholars and six Jewish scholars, six Christian scholars who came up with certain points. The Muslim scholars said, if you really want peace in this society, It's not enough to be tolerant and say, I tolerate the other. It's not enough to say, I respect the other. This Muslim scholar said, the Quran prescribes that we have to celebrate the other. This is a Quranic injunction. Secondly, these six Islamic scholars said, we simply have to redefine 
our definition of community. The Quran says, everything progresses little by little. For Muslims, the community has been always the Muslim Ummah, brotherhood and sisterhood. This has to be extended to what the Quran says, Al Nas, global humanity. As a great sage Rumi says, please let's come out of the circle of time and enter the circle of love. Thank you.